there, and you've tuned in Struggles of the Spirit. I'm the Reverend Lee Udell, uh, a pastoral care specialist. Uh, I'm the host of the series. And we have a, I have a friend here, uh, Michael McKnight. Uh, he is media services for uh, the Fletcher Allen Healthcare, and he's been doing that for a long time, and he has a lot of experience uh, even before that in, in media services. Our, our subject today is, is talking about, about um, comparative religion and how that demonstrates uh, the human quest for God, looking for a meaning, a purpose, uh, an absolute that, that is not just transient, something beyond uh, my lifetime or, or the history of, of a country, something that's eternal, some meaning in life that that's, uh, has that kind of significance. And uh, we, uh, we're we going to have a series uh, after today uh, concentrating on individual religious groups, Islam and, and uh, Buddhism and uh, Judaism, uh, Christianity uh, and some others. But today we're taking a broad view, uh, comparative religion, uh, all kinds of religious groups throughout the world. Uh, we're looking at, uh, obviously, we don't have time to, to do, the, do them all. But I've asked Michael to come and, and, and address uh, uh, how in all of those uh, uh, religious practices, religious uh, ideologies, uh, how, how does one see the human quest for, for God uh, worked out? And, and is there anything you might say, I'm giving you two questions, is there anything you might say that you, you see in common uh, um, in the struggle of the spirit in, in comparative religion? Well, before I start, perhaps I should uh, say why I'm qualified, if I am qualified, to, <laughs> to speak about this, true, this matter. True. Uh, because uh, it's true that I'm uh, coordinator of media services at Fletcher Island Healthcare, but uh, in a former life, I was a professor of uh, comparative religion at the University of Vermont, and I continue actually as an adjunct faculty member in philosophy at Champlain College, so I have some credentials to, to talk about it. Uh, yes, I would, I would like to address you as Dr. Yeah. McKnight, uh, but you, you don't encourage me to do that. <laughs> well, there's some confusion in the medical world sometimes when they call for Dr. <laughs> McKnight. Uh, let's see, um, the, the question is the, the common elements in, in the world's religions. Yeah. I, w I would say uh, that on a fundamental level, uh, we seek meaning in our lives. And that search for meaning can take many different forms. Uh, over the centuries, one culture might uh, look for meaning more in a material realm, i.e. development of scientific awareness and uh, biology and such. And another culture might look more in a mystical, inward-seeking realm for, for meaning. But what they have in common, those two paths, is they're looking for some significance. Why we are here, really, it's as fundamental as that. And the world's religions have developed uh, various answers to that question. I think one common element in all the world's religions is that life is worth living, that fundamentally it is a good. The one possible exception to that is, uh, is Buddhism. But even with Buddhism, I think that they recognize that uh, being human is a remarkable opportunity to achieve enlightenment. And really, we can't achieve enlightenment, which is the goal of uh, Buddhism, without human incarnation. Along that line, let me put you on the spot here. Was it Buddhism or Hinduism where the, the father of, of, was it of Gautama, there were three things he didn't want his son to experience in life, and he tried to protect him from yes. those three things. Yes. Can you? Can you remember sure. what the three things were? Oh, yes. Uh, that actually goes back to the legend of the birth of the Buddha. And uh, the Buddha's father, according to this legend, which is partly history, uh, was a king, or at least a tribal leader in what's now southern Nepal, uh, King Sudogna. And uh, his uh, wife was Queen Maya. And uh, she had a dream that she would uh, conceive uh, well, actually, it was a dream that a white elephant came down out of the sky and entered her side. And she went to the, the gurus, the wise men of the time, and she said, what does this mean? And they said, well, your son is either going to be a Chakravartin, which is a universal emperor, a turner of the wheel, uh, a political leader, in other words, or he's going to be a spiritual leader and lead people towards enlightenment. Now, the king, being a good king, didn't want his son to be a spiritual leader. He wanted him to be an emperor. 
And so he shielded his son for really the first 30 years of his life, uh, according to the legend, from any sign of decay, sickness, uh, aging, or death. And uh, according to the legend, the Buddha one day went out and uh, saw this in a village. He saw uh, a sick person, decrepit person, uh, aged person, a corpse. And then also the fourth site was a, a, a sadhu, a, a holy man. And he vowed at that point that he would seek the tranquility that he saw in the eyes of the holy man. And so he left his princely life and went out and searched. And then the story goes on until he does achieve nirvana, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you. I thought that somehow fit what you were saying. Yeah. Maybe more detail. Well, uh, those really are the things that we're contending with here. Uh, humans have, um, I think in the animal world, maybe the unique capacity to uh, be aware of mortality. And uh, I don't see this in, in animals. Um, and in a way, that may make them happier, I don't know. Uh, but we do have uh, the acute awareness that life is very transient. And this forces this search for meaning. It makes it more of an urgent situation because uh, particularly in the West where we believe that we're only here for one lifetime mm -hmm. uh, and that our eternal future is judged on the basis of how we perform in that one lifetime, it makes it acutely important for us to seek meaning in our lives. Uh, we don't have the luxury of sitting back and saying, well, you know, I'll catch it next time or, you know, maybe a few lifetimes from now. So you, you would see that as a common theme in all, all of the world's religions, trying to cope with the tra transient uh, character of life and, uh, and to find some meaning beyond our three score years or whatever it is on this earth. Absolutely. Um, <coughs> Tillich, uh, I think, defined uh, religion as uh, our uh, way of dealing with matters of ultimate concern. And the, the, the phrase ultimate concern, I think, is very significant in uh, the study of religion because our ultimate concerns living in 1997 are really the same as they were in the time of mm -hmm. Socrates or the time of Buddha or Confucius or Lao Tzu or any number of the other sages. That is, again, search for meaning. The significance of love in our lives, what other people mean to us, uh, the uh, problem uh, relating to uh, aging, the fact that our life is transformed, mortality, uh, as well as the feeling that we have made a difference in our lives. This goes along with the search for meaning, that, that our life has not been in vain, that it hasn't just been a, uh, you know, a, a a passing uh, conglomerate of molecules signifying nothing, you know, as uh, Shakespeare would say, tomorrow and tomorrow creeps on at its petty pace, a tale told by an idiot signifying nothing. We hate that thought. We <laughs> yes, don't want we our do. lives to be a tale told by an that's idiot right. signifying nothing. So religion, now how do they do this? I guess that's the more fundamental question. If that's their goal, how do they do this? Well, they do this through myth, symbol, and ritual. These are the major keys in providing meaning in our life. Myth would simply be sacred narratives that are told in the tradition that provide guidance or orientation for followers of that tradition. These would relate to myths of cosmology, how the world came to be, uh, myths of the hero quest, which is also the search for meaning that Joseph Campbell covered mm -hmm. so well in The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Uh, and uh, myths relating to uh, the gods and the goddesses uh, uh, and how they relate to our lives. So that's mythology. It's not myth, myth in a common sense of the term where we say, well, that's just a myth. Don't believe that. This is myth that is truer than history in a way because it conveys central values to those that believe it. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Then uh, symbol, these would be concrete icons, sacred objects that uh, it might be a cross or a, a yin-yang symbol or any Mantra number of other things. Or something. That, uh, well, that would be a sacred sound, a <coughs> mantra, yeah. That would, uh, I was thinking a yantra in Hinduism, which is a sacred diagram. No, I'm not uh, saying what I mean. I, I, I meant uh, 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 mandala. Mandala. Uh, yeah, that's exactly. I mean. And that's a symbol for, for holy, uh, wholeness and unity. So these symbols point the way. They're concrete manifestations of the sacred. And then uh, this uh, symbol of ritual is very important. And that's something in a secular society we don't have enough of, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. we've got the ritual in a secular society of watching the Super Bowl game <laughs> or uh, I don't know what other rituals we have that bring us together as families, uh, but uh, so rituals do this. A sociologist uh, who was on the series told, told me that he, he, he thinks the, the ritual of Ed Sullivan 
uh, his his Sunday evening show, I guess, changed the nature of going to Christian worship in the evening on Sundays. You think that was one of the main main uh, things that Ed Sullivan's uh, program became a, a ritual, a, a Sunday night ritual, uh, and that was kind of thought provoking. Yeah. The fact is, I guess anything can become a ritual if it's accepted as a sacred activity by a group of b people that believe in it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so how would you define sacred? I think that fits. Okay. You, you use that word there. Uh, how would you define sacred? Well, I think you, you have to introduce a dichotomy if you're talking about sacred, and they, the dichotomy is sacred profane. And okay. let me define profane sure. first, uh, not using any profanity at all. But it's <laughs> it's uh, that which is not sacred, that which is ordinary, uh, related to everyday uh, reality, not set apart. Uh, most of what we experience in our daily lives is profane reality or uh, this worldly reality. Um, any number of examples would do on that point. Sacred is. Uh, related to the myths and the symbols of the tradition uh, and it's well let's take time time for example you can have ordinary time like the time right now mm -hmm. this, is, this is profane ordinary time if we were involved in a ritual uh, event that would be sacred time which is non-ordinary time now is the meter still ticking yes it is but the way we experience that time is different uh, Marcia Eliade, who was one of the greatest thinkers in comparative religion, uh, talked about uh, sacred time as a return to the origins, that we can do this at any time uh, when we enter a, a sacred reality which is set apart from ordinary reality. Now a skeptic, would a skeptic say, all this is just in their heads? Yes. And would the skeptic be right? Well, no, they wouldn't be right. They'd be right for them because they don't see the significance of the sacred. But for those that do see it and those that believe it, it's, it's perhaps more real than the profane world. Well, thinking of the skeptic, uh, there, there's a saying that we, we all have, probably the skeptic as well, if, if uh, the time stood still. Yes. You know, that, that, that we will say that, uh, like, uh, as though there, there was no passage of time. I was so uh, immersed in, in, in what we were doing that, that uh, uh, I just, time had no meaning. I for, right. forgot to look at my watch. I didn't, I, right. I didn't get hungry. <laughs> it just stood still. Now, does that fit yeah. what you're talking about? Yeah, there's a, a, a marvelous book, I think, uh, called Flow, The Psychology of Optimal Experience. And it's written by a, um, a psychologist from the University of Chicago whose name I cannot pronounce. I will, mm -hmm. that I won't even try. <coughs> He's written several, but Flow is by far the best. And he says whenever we're absorbed in an activity, whatever that is, that creative activity that we're really concentrating on, we experience that time out of time. Mm -hmm. And I, now whether that's called sacred time or not, I won't quibble about that, but it's very similar. That is that we have the capacity, time is an absolute to a certain degree, but time is relative in a, in a more important degree, and, and we can slow down time. Even when we stop and we're trying to remember something, if you imagine somebody walking along the street and they're trying to remember something, they'll stop in their tracks quite mm -hmm. frequently, won't they? Yes, they If will. they're trying to forget something, a bad experience they just had, they'll move very fast. And so uh, the whole idea of slowing things down, uh, Milan Conundra has written a book called Slowness, a, a novel where he deals with this, this <laughs> concept of, he says we're going too fast in society, we need to respect the wisdom of slowness and slow things down. And I think that sac the experience of the sacred does that exactly, uh, whether it's a Catholic mass or a... Uh, uh, Hindu uh, ritual or whatever, uh, it has that in common of, of stepping out of ordinary time. Shakespeare said time must have a stop. Uh, uh, I think that that point is there, that we need to come back to profane time, because you can't spend all your time in sacred time, I don't think, unless you're a monk or, or a saint or an uh, enlightened guru or something. So we always come back into profane time, but we come back refreshed by that experience of having touched another reality, if you will. Yeah, and, you know, just what you do with your day off. I mean, it, sometimes it's amazing. It's a very productive, wonderful day. It seems like you have spent three days within 24 hours, and <laughs> if it's not a productive day, it just it just feels very different. It, uh, you don't have that sense of timelessness. Right. 
I wish I could think of a line from William Blake where he talks about uh, experiencing uh, eternity in an hour and uh, seeing the universe in a flower. You probably know that. I know uh, it, but I if can't the doors of perception it. were open wide, we'd see the world as it is truly infinite. Mm -hmm. um, th those ideas are all there. I, I guess what I'm saying here, corroborating what you're saying, is, is that even the skeptic would, 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 uh, would, would, because the skeptic is a human being, if they look at themselves, they will see that they do experience secular time and they do experience uh, sacred time. They might not call it by those terms, but. If you're a human being, you, you, you experience these things. Absolutely. And in secular society, uh, that which is sacred is really that which is most important to the individual. Uh, it might be money, mm -hmm. for example. A uh, uh, hundred dollar bill or something might have a sacred aura <laughs> to it, you know. And that's okay. I'm not saying, but I say that as far as reference to, uh, to uh, the sacred, uh, money doesn't do it. No, no. no. Uh, in fact, money. Uh, so, so it's a question of really where the values are for the individual, uh, what they view as as sacred. Obviously, life itself is sacred. I mean, if we start with that fundamental prem mm -hmm. premise, then we're probably on the mm -hmm. right track uh, and treat it that way. Uh, when I was in a parish, it was in New York City, in Manhattan, on 74th Street and Park Avenue. I had one parishioner uh, who was very wealthy. She lived in a triplex penthouse on Park Avenue. She had a, uh, a home in Bermuda with servants, and she also had an apartment in London with servants. And, uh, and she meant this seriously. She would, this, we were good friends, and I was her priest, and she once said to me, you know, sometimes at the end of the month, I don't know how I'm going to make ends meet. <laughs> Now, <laughs> you would think someone who would say that would be someone who was poor or, or had just enough to get by. And here, here she had all of these uh, pieces of real estate. And, uh, and she, she, would, she meant that in a material sense, like dollars. Yeah, yeah, that's right. She said, how am I going to pay uh -huh. for all these, these costs? <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's amazing. The money doesn't make the difference. No. It really doesn't. Uh, do you see anything in common about how, how the nature of God? Uh, I mean, you, you look at in, from comparative religion. I mean, I mean as, as seen from the human side, obviously, we, we can't look at the nature of God from the, from the uh, deity side. I mean, we, we, we only can look from where we are. But um, when you look at primitive religions, that there, there is human sacrifice, as we, we know. Uh, there are all kinds of rituals and customs and uh, statements about God in, in different, different uh, cultures and religions uh, that sometimes l lead the followers to do uh, very, very different acts uh, from one, one religious group to another. Do you, uh, how, what do you, what do you, what do you, can you say that people who do human sacrifice or did human sacrifice in the past were quote unquote sincere, devout, uh, religious people, or, or, or do we look at them as a bunch of, of uh, horrible monsters who, who had no real religion at all? Uh, I don't know if I'm, uh, if I can really answer that. Uh, it depends on how we define religion. Uh, and okay. uh, religion involves a certain discipline going back to the root to sort of bind oneself to something uh, religio. Uh, they have, uh, they are religious uh, because they are bound to that uh, system of thought. Now that's a non-judgmental view, I think, just saying uh, that they're, are, are they ethically right? Uh, no, I would say they're not, but they are religious in their own terms. Is that a way, is that a cop-out or what? Uh, no, I think it, according to how you use yeah. that term, um, uh, I, I think that this leads to a question I posed earlier before the, the program started today. Uh, are some religions closer to the truth and, and some religions further from the truth? And truth meaning by my definition, what God is like and what how God would have us was, would live in relationship to, to, to God. 
Well, that obviously is a big question. And yes, it probably is. <laughs> it's an unfair uh, question. No contest in the court of theology because, <laughs> uh, you know, as it says in the Tao Te Ching, those that talk don't know and those that know don't talk. So the best possible answer I could probably give you would be silence. However, <laughs> that wouldn't work on a television program, particularly a live television program. So I'll give you a shot at it. I look at uh, religion as it relates to daily life and uh, because I actually uh, am a pragmatist in the philosophical sense and uh, a follower in a sense of John Dewey, a native son of Burlington. And Buried graduated. right here in, in, on right the hill. To Arayan, yes, and uh, he uh, spoke about uh, the cash value of truth, that is, what difference, let's you take a proposition, what difference does it practically make in the individual's life to believe this or not? Does it make any difference at all? And if so, what's the difference? So if you look at that uh, view of mm -hmm. God, belief mm -hmm. in God, does it make any practical difference in the individual's life? And I would say, on the whole, yes. Mm -hmm. Then you ask the further question. A and when I say yes, what I mean is that person derives more meaning, going back to this uh, original idea of s search for meaning, more meaning and significance, and perhaps happiness even in the face of adversity, uh, which many studies have brought out. And, and even longevity. Uh, people that believe in God tend to live longer, strangely enough. Yeah. I think that relates to the sense of meaning around them and love. But uh, does it make any practical difference what type of God they believe in? Mm -hmm. And here there's no data, I don't think. However, uh, I would say that uh, in terms of ethical beliefs, this goes back to your cannibalistic uh, analogy there, uh, yes, there's uh, that belief in God, whatever that God is that demands human sacrifice, uh, is uh, uh, when you sugar it off, to use a Vermont expression <laughs> and a very one, appropriate one for this time of year, when it sugars down to uh, cannibalism or human sacrifice, there's something the matter there because uh, uh, ethically the uh, outcome is uh, faulty. I think we'd agree. I, I certainly believe that. Mm -hmm. So I look in the person's life and I say, what ethically, what helps what belief in God? And I think uh, probably the highest belief there is a belief in God as spirit and spirit being manifested as love uh, because the ethical uh, outcome of that is to believe, to believe in a life of love and to walk in that way. And that may be the highest way of being human. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Exhibited by people like Mother Teresa and, and other outstanding individuals. Um, and to all of us, by all of us, to a certain extent, I think, we're like light bulbs here. Some of us are a lot brighter than others. And I, here I don't mean just in, in light-giving uh, intensity here. Mm -hmm. And some of us are more like um, night lights, you know. Uh, Dim. But, <laughs> Dim. but we're all drawing on that common source of electricity, which is spiritual in nature. And those outstanding individuals, like I mentioned Mother Teresa, uh, uh, have opened that channel wider. They've stepped out of the way enough so that they're manifest it, manifesting it to an extraordinary degree. And others haven't stepped out as much uh, out of the way, mm -hmm. as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're all on that, that same frequency, I think. Um, does that answer that question? I don't know. I could ramble on that one for a while. Uh, I think so. There was one word you used. Uh, I my mind wandered, and I can't remember what the word was, but I thought it would be worth defining a little more clearly. Uh, well, that'll come back. Um. Light bulb. <laughs> no, it was another, no, it another word. Well, anyway, I, sh I should, should not pursue it. Um, you know, from the, from the orthodox uh, Christian perspective, uh, there is, there is a, there are are some Christians, many Christians, uh, that claim you know that there's only one way to God, and uh, that's being baptized and probably confirmed and receiving the, the sacrament and and to throw in some of the evangelical perspective uh, to believing in Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And if you don't do that, man, it doesn't matter how sincere you are, what religion you practice, what the quality of your life is like, you have had it when you die, and you're going to go to eternal torment, or will just cease to exist, uh, maybe one or the other, uh, and that all of life and all of religions are, are uh, uh, well, uh, set against that background, that, that stage, and uh, 
uh, and that uh, you and I are, are wasting our time talking about comparative religion. There's only there's only one way to go, and everything else is uh, is, is perhaps a sent the, to uh, humanity by by the devil to lead us away from that. Uh, uh, I have some strong feelings about that that p position, uh, but. You're my guest, well, okay. I'll well, ad lib as you go along. Actually, I anticipated that question coming in from the phone lines. Uh, <laughs> somebody was saying that we're, because a long time ago I was on a Vermont hotline that dealt with cults, and uh, I guess I was the, I played that role of being uh, the uh, the humanist or the comparative religionist, and, I, and a call did come in and said that, uh, you know, I was pretty much a lost soul on that. Uh, and my response to it is that, um, uh, I'm sympathetic with the people that take a fundamentalist view. That is, if it enables them to lead more meaningful, loving lives, far be it for me to say that they're on the wrong track. Uh, I, I really, honestly, I go back to how it uh, sugars off in our own life that makes the difference. If, if on the other hand, there somebody is very dogmatic and uh, very uh, opinionated and forces everyone to see things their way, I would say that uh, they're not living in the fullness of spirit. They're not allowing mm -hmm. the openness to be there that, that is characteristic of fully developed human beings, spiritual beings. So uh, uh, I, I wouldn't argue with them because, first of all, it's pointless to argue with them. Right. I, I, you really don't convince anyone that way. Uh, my own view there is that, uh, uh, well, there's a story that's told by uh, uh, Lessing, uh, the, mm -hmm. the German playwright Lessing, in uh, the, the play he wrote called Nathan the Wise, a very obscure play that I read when I was at UVM in a course that uh, Harry Kahn taught in mm. German literature and translation. Yeah, good memory. Yeah, I do remember this play. And uh, Nathan the Wise was a very wise uh, uh, Jewish uh, uh, merchant in the in the, uh, the time of the Crusades and. Uh, he tells a story because uh, the crusader likes him, as I recall, and says, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're a true Christian. And Nathan responds that what makes uh, me a Christian to you makes you a Jew to me. And then he proceeded to tell the story of a wise king who had three sons. And uh, he loved each well, and he gave each a ring. Uh, he had a, a craftsman style of ring that was exactly the same. And the ring was the ring of sovereignty. Uh, the true king. And because they were so alike, even the king couldn't tell them apart. And he gave one to each of his sons. Uh, so that each felt that they had the true ring. Because the wisdom of knowing which is the true ring really belongs to God. It doesn't really belong to us. So we can't presume to know. Uh, but we can act as if mm -hmm. we're in possession of that ring. Because that ring itself is, is human existence, I think, is, is just being here, you know, and, and what we make of it, we mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's really uh, up, up to us, and uh, as well as, you know, help from above. You know, the Christians have a parable of the talents that Jesus yeah, exactly. tells. Same, I think the same moral is there in, in that right. the story of the talents. Uh, Some of you may not know that, but <coughs> the, in, in the parable, a, a master gives gives to three people different sums of money. He, to one, he, he gives like a $100 bill. To another, he gives a $200 bill. And to the third, maybe he gives a $500 bill. And, uh, and the master's going off, and he wants them to, to use, use the money uh, appropriately well and responsibly. And then when he comes back after some time has gone by, he, he, he asks people, what have you done with what you've been given? And uh, person who had the $500 bill uh, has now made $1,000. Uh, it uh, gives it back to the master, and the person who had the $100 bill has also made some money, and he, he has now gives him the $200 back, and the one who got the $100 bill said, well, I know how tough you are and how demanding you are, and I was afraid I might lose the $100 if I invested it anywhere, so I buried it in the ground, and I dug it up when you came back, and here it is. And uh, it did not go well <laughs> for the person with a hundred dollar bill with a master. He, he he felt that the person did not really use what he had been given. He buried it. Well, it is time for uh, phoning. Uh, we 
we, we set aside a half an hour for you to come and join us. Uh, I have taken the position that uh, be the third person here. Uh, don't, uh, don't just say I have to come up with a good question. Uh, uh, you don't have to necessarily uh, come up with a good question. If you think there's something you want to say, we can help you uh, formulate it. Uh, our, our number, you can see it on the television screen, but it's 658-5165. Uh, do call us. We, we're really, seriously, we're eager to hear your input because uh, I know Michael well and, uh, and I know myself well. And I think we're both interested in learning, and we're both interested in, in hearing from, from other people their thoughts, their ideas, their experience, and uh, uh, that makes life a very rich place. And so uh, we will continue to converse, but uh, I will from time to time interrupt our flow and uh, again uh, ask you to call us. Uh, so so please, uh, please give us a ring, 658-51. Uh, Six five. So we. Uh, I brought along a little quote here. Okay. Uh, yeah, which might uh, inspire some people to call in. This comes from uh, Gibran's book, The Prophet, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, uh, he talks about the nature of the deity, and he says, "If you would know God, be not therefore a solver of riddles." Rather, look about you and see him playing with your children, and look into space, and you shall see him walking in the cloud, outstretching his arms, in the lightning and the descending rain. You shall see him smiling in flowers, then rising and waving his hands in trees. Uh, kind of a pantheistic view of God, but um, one that I think uh, deserves some respect. That is, uh, uh, the sacred dimension is there even in the profane dimension because the sacred and profane are really attitudes towards experience mm -hmm. more than concrete things. Mm -hmm. So a cup, an ordinary cup, can be either a sacred item or a profane item. For most of us it is a profane item, but if it were involved in a ritual that conveyed sacred water or something, then it would be a sacred item. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. there's not, I guess my point is fairly obvious, there's nothing intrinsic in the cup that's either no, or no. It's just the context. It's the, it's the context. We provide the, the meaning there. So we have the choice there, I think, uh, mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. The choice to drink or not to drink. That's true. Uh, I, I, in terms of comparative religion, I, I was, a long time ago, I was, I was struggling with this question, uh, you know, uh, from the Christian point of view. What, 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 does, what does God think about uh, how does God look at a Buddhist or, or, or a Hindu or, or someone from Islam? Uh, and, uh, and how do I take some of the sayings in the Bible that are pretty damning for someone who isn't a, a baptized, believing Christian? And, and uh, I struggled for quite a while with that. And then, and then I began to realize that God's grace is operative everywhere. God doesn't just give his grace to Christians or people who might become Christians. God gives his grace to everyone. I mean, the rain falls, as the mm -hmm. scripture says, on the just and the unjust, and God's grace falls on us all. And uh, God's love is on all of his creation. He doesn't just love the, the, the Christians that he has created. He loves every single human being all over the earth, no matter what their religious choice. And so then the question really is, is that... Uh, uh, like the parable of the talents, what, what, what have you done with, with, ha with how you have known God in your particular culture? And uh, so I remember a long time ago coming up with a uh, with sort of a, of a formula where I think that God far more uh, uh, accepts as his own a, a Buddhist or, or a Hindu who, who, ha who knows uh, Using the Christian term, the the the, the peace of, uh, that passes all understanding, uh, that that person who devoutly enters into a knowledge of God in and through their their, their culture, in God's eyes, he would smile much more broadly on them than on some Christian who has gone through the motions of being baptized and confirmed, and, and, and but has never really gone very far in the Christian life. 
uh, and um, and haven't hasn't really become aware of God's grace or of what Gibran is saying. You know how God is is all about us. Uh, there was a uh, there's a famous uh, now deceased uh, Roman Catholic spiritual writer uh, Thomas Merton, and his Asian journal he, he writes about his trip in, in Asia, and uh, and he met the Dalai Lama when the Lama was still in Tibet, and he <coughs> they had many conversations and they began to feel that they both had a common understanding of of the infinite of of God and. Uh, they had some different language as they talked about it, yes. but the experience was the same. Uh, uh, there's a, a, a book, <clears throat> actually the Pope wrote, called Crossing the Threshold. Oh, really? Oh, yes, and he was asked that question. The book consists of answers to uh, a journalist's question, and one of them was, how do you view exactly that, that question? Uh, how do you view other religions in relationship to Christianity? And uh, the Pope chose a different approach, as you might imagine, and uh, had a sort of a hierarchy of taking Christianity, uh, particularly Roman Catholicism, as the highest or closest to the true, truest religion, and then grouping in with them, uh, with that uh, Judaism and uh, Islam, mm -hmm. and uh, then further down, Hinduism, and then at the lowest rank, he uh, put Buddhism. Really? And, uh, and New Age religions, uh, because... Put them together? Uh, well, yes, kind of lumped them together as uh, kind of a Gnostic, uh, you know, Gnosticism is a heresy in uh, Christianity, and the idea of man becoming divine or making themselves divine through introspection or however is anathema. I mean, it's, it's just not acceptable. So he did have some less, well, it weren't, weren't unkind things to say, because Pope is probably never unkind, but uh, less than uh, uh, favorable things to say about uh, uh, Buddhism and uh, what he called New Age religions, or Gnosticism in a new form. Hmm. Uh, and that Gnosticism does pop up all over the place. Even the Heaven's Gate thing, to talk about a recent event, has a lot of Gnostic overtones, um, the way that uh, they viewed life on Earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I don't know if we want to get into that. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Might get some calls, though. I don't know. Yes, we are looking for calls. We'll say outrageous things just to <laughs> get calls. And just to get some calls, get some irate to, to call us up. 658-5165, uh, please. Please give us a ring. We're okay. not even asking for money here. No, no. <laughs> this is not for, you've got to make your pledge, but we we're not even be, asking to make We have to be very careful. We're not asking for you <laughs> to make a contribution to Channel 15, at least not today, anyway. Uh, so p please, uh, please join us. Uh, well, one thing reflecting on uh, you know the the understanding of of God in in world's religions is a dichotomy between a non-personal or impersonal view of the absolute and a personal view of the absolute. Well, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Well, because that hangs a lot of people up. This uh, <coughs> really comes out in um, in Hindu Hindu philosophy um, where the concept of the absolute is called Brahman, and Brahman has two aspects, if you will. Nirguna, which is n without qualities, uh, ineffable, eternal, can't even think about it mm -hmm. because it's mm -hmm. just beyond thought. But because people can't conceive of the inconceivable, Brahman also has qualities, or saguna Brahman, which would be a deity. Um, Meister Eckhart had the same kind of uh, analogy when he talked about the Godhead and God, that we can't conceive of the Godhead, but we can conceive of God with qualities, being merciful and um, in heaven and, mm -hmm. and all of the qualities that we associate. Uh, which is true, uh, one might ask, and uh, I, I would say that uh, probably they both are. It, it, it's not up for us to say that one is truer than the other, it's just that if we try to understand the immensity of the universe with our little minds, even though they're big minds, but with our little minds, we're always going to be frustrated. And so we need one thing religion does in providing meaning is provides a way of understanding that which is fundamentally incomprehensible, which is the nature of ultimate reality, uh, which is, I would say, in the Hindu context, Nirguna Brahman. 
Um, the basic message of Vedanta philosophy is that thou art, tattvamasi, you are it. How you understand that is really, uh, that's, that's the search. How you, how you relate to the fact that, that you are Brahman mm -hmm. is, is part of the search. And, I, and in that search, uh, the view of God with qualities is, I think it's essential. Uh, you can't, you know, have a Sunday school and talk about uh, inconceivable, uh, ineffable essence <laughs> underlying all the universe and exceeding it. Doesn't make any sense. Doesn't no. compute. No. Uh, so we need something that computes. And again, it's all for good if it leads a person towards a fuller, more meaningful, loving, all those things that we talked about before. Now, in, in Buddhism, the concept uh, is that of the Buddha mind, uh, which is more innate in us. Each of us has a seed or bodhicitta that uh, we have to nourish and bring forth. And if we bring it forth correctly, uh, following the Noble Eightfold Path, it will result in our own nirvana, our own enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's a, a little different than the goal of, of uh, Hinduism, where you're trying to become one with, uh, where you, uh, actually, better said, you're trying to realize your oneness, uh, because that's there. Uh, to a certain extent, that's there in Buddhism as well. Buddhism is really a spin-off of, of the Hindu tradition, mm -hmm. but uh, put the emphasis more on the individual and took out that Saguna Brahman, the idea of God with qualities, took it out completely. Uh, said that that's not conducive to no, enlightenment. <coughs> Particularly in Zen Buddhism. Yes. That, that's avoided like the plague. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And the emphasis is put on <coughs> practical realization. A, a Zen student would go to the master and say, tell me how to find uh, the way to the original mind. And the master would say, if you are trying to find it, you will never find it, you know. Uh, and then he says, well, how can I find it? And he says, well, just be that. You know, it's, it's more fundamental than you know, putting a lot of words at it, um, the reality exceeds the quality of words. Uh, <coughs> the Roman Catholic uh, theologian, uh, famous uh, for his, his categorizing, St. Thomas Aquinas, at the end of his, of his uh, uh, writings, he, he said, speaking of it, he said, it's all straw. <laughs> it's all straw. But, uh, because he can't begin to describe God. Right. <clears throat> and that, that's always comforted me when I try to read his writings. Uh, <laughs> because there's so many, the Summa and stuff <clears throat> like that. And then I thought, well, ultimately he judged them all straw anyway. So <laughs> that's that right. Kind of gets me off the hook. Yeah. yeah. Again, we invite you to call, phone in. Uh, 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 Michael McKnight and, and I, Lee Udell, here await, await your call. We have a, a few more minutes. Uh, there, there's some people who have uh, have said that in uh, you know in, in Eastern religions the idea is to lose your individuality to become just a drop in the ocean of, of God. Uh, uh, and do you want to say something about that kind of concept? It's a Western concept. I don't really think an Asian would, who was devout would. We would put it that way. Uh, well, it was sort of a negative comment when it's said by a Westerner. Uh, yes, and I think that it reflects uh, uh, not really understanding the tradition to a certain extent. Uh, because if you have this concept of uh, Brahman as a universal, impersonal, absolute, uh, and your goal is to become that, then the uh, consequence of that would be a loss of your individuality. Um, just as uh, viewing your individuality as a craft or a vessel to get you to uh, y the other side, after that, um, it's no longer there. Um, the, the vessel is no longer needed, if you will. So, um, the, but the idea is not to kill the ego uh, for the sake of killing the ego. I don't think that's it at all. Uh, uh, up to that point of enlightenment, the ego is absolutely essential in functioning in life. I mean, it's not something, it's you, really. I mean, you don't want to, mm -hmm. but it's not all of you. That's the key. And this is in Jungian 
psychology as well. Uh, Jung uh, had uh, remarkable insights into the nature of reality and uh, into comparative religion, for that matter, because he was a great scholar of that as well. And he talked about the ego-self axis, uh, where the ego is uh, sort of the brightly lit little corner of the psyche, but the self uh, is there, present, but largely unconscious. Mm. And creating a, uh, a conscious bridge between the ego and the self expands the personality, and this is the function of individuation. This is the problem of the second half of life, which he was talking about, allowing yourself to, to come out of that small box and into, into a larger reality. And that, to me, is entirely in sync with what Eastern religions teach. Mm -hmm. Now, Harvey Cox pointed out that the journey to the East is important, but what's really important is bringing it all back home again. When I see Westerners, um, you know, wearing Hindu robes and calling themselves Govinda and chanting, um, no offense to the Hare Krishna people, but I'm not sure that that's really the goal here, uh, because we have a, a certain imprint, you might say, of certain cultural bias that to... Uh, well, actually, Jung wrote a, a long, a very enlightened essay about his friend Richard Wilhelm, who was the translator of the I Ching, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he called it something about um, spirit, spirituality, East and West, or something like that, and uh, he talked about the dangers of adopting wholeheartedly a, another form of spirituality, including myths, symbols, and rituals, when we really have our own indigenous tradition. And this is part of my mm -hmm. struggle to come back again, because I went east both physically and mentally or intellectually a while ago, and I've, but my real work is here, mm -hmm. and integrating it into my life as a uh, parent, as a, you know, husband, as a worker, uh, all of those aspects of my life, you know, making it here and now and not something uh, that's, you know, far away mm -hmm. and unreal. Yeah, the practical aspects of of being a Westerner. <clears throat> it ain't easy. No. It ain't no. easy. But uh, I do think that uh, science, you know, there was a very good book uh, by Capra a long time ago, about 1975, called The Tao of Physics, where he talked about the what modern physics, which I don't pretend to understand, and Eastern mysticism and religions have in common. They, uh, they each view reality along the same lines. Um, and so I do see we're heading towards a synthesis where religion and science finally make friends uh, together again. Mm -hmm. And the search for meaning that we talked about in the beginning, one part taking a search into the material world and the other into the psychological or inner world, come together. Um, that only makes sense, particularly if we're planning to survive on this planet. Yes, uh, it's a small <laughs> planet. <laughs> it's a small planet, and there are many, many of us, so we have to learn to live with it, live with it, and, um, and be with it. And that seems to be one way to do it. Mm -hmm. Hey, we got Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, we welcome you to participate here with us today. Hello? Hello? Hello. Hello, we welcome you here. Um, uh, come, and, come and join us. Hi, how you doing? Uh, I uh, don't hear very well, but I guess uh, you can hear me. Uh, uh, what is your guest name? Uh, Michael McKnight. I'm, uh, well, Michael, I really appreciate what you've been saying. Uh, I'm a believer of uh, good or bad, of living in the moment. And I think that's the uh, underlying theme of all religions, I believe. So I really enjoyed hearing what you've been saying. Well, thank you. So it's not so much a question, but just a comment, then. Sure. Well, uh, actually, uh, our volume is, is, is getting lower here. Uh, uh, it's hard, hard to hear your voice now. OK. Sorry about that. That's better. Uh, Thank uh, you. Yeah, well, I've, I've always believed that uh, you know, we contain good and bad, and you know, everything that's in the universe in our makeup, and that religion is basically uh, our interpretations of this, and uh, that if we get lost in the interpretation, then, you know, we forget where we're truly coming from. So I think that's what our, our struggle seems to be, is either negating ourselves or being positive and trying to uh, come into an overall understanding of ourselves. So I appreciate what you've been saying today. Great. Well, it's good to know that somebody is out there that appreciates what we're saying. That's, that's very heartening, <laughs> I tell you. Because we like talking to each other, but we're not here just to talk to each other. <laughs> no. 
Uh, do you want to say more about living in the moment? What that well, means? I, actually, you know, I, I called you once before. We uh, discussed this uh, a few weeks back. Oh, and I know okay. that uh, when I get lost in any uh, anger or any uh, you know reactions to situations or this and that, I'm reacting uh, to the past, even though it's like a few seconds mm -hmm. before, right? Okay. So I'm like hanging on to uh, that situation, whether it be a good feeling or a bad feeling. Mm -hmm. But I believe that living in the moment, that doesn't mean you have to forget everything in your past because you need to associate, you have to have associations of knowledge and this and that. So if you uh, live in the moment without having your previous knowledge, then you're basically not experiencing anything, right? Mm -hmm. But I believe if you live in the moment with using the positive associations of the past without hanging on to uh, associations with them, if I can say that that way, then that way you can live in the moment and experience everything as a sort of like a third person within yourself. If you understand what I'm saying that way. I think you should get this guy on your program, Lee. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't, you're probably familiar with the line from William Blake, um, but it seems to sum up that view of reality uh, where he says, he who binds himself to a joy does the winged life destroy, but he who kisses each joy as it flies lives in eternity's sunrise. Mm. Great I like line. that. I like that one. Yeah, I do too. I, and you know, you look around and there's so many people that are binding themselves to a joy, whatever that is. It might be another person and they won't allow yeah. that person to change or it might be uh, whatever, a job, it could be anything. Yeah. Um, and that destroys the, 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 the thing. It, even though you're trying to keep it that by the that and it's a tough lesson but to I like the analogy of kissing each joy as it flies saying hi to it you know and but not trying to <laughs> yeah grab it down yeah. Yeah. I think that's what happens when people have uh, relationships and they uh, tend to uh, have a misery or a joy in them they tend to want to hang on to the, uh, the out of fear of uh, what's going to come after or whatever but I believe that that attachment is uh, basically the word for, the, for a lot of that I wonder if you ever read any Douglas Harding. Uh, I haven't. Have you? I don't think so. No. Yeah, he wrote, he wrote a book now. It sounds a bit strange. The title is called on, it's sort of on a Zen-like basis. It's, it's called on having no head. Uh -huh. Okay. And he, the analogy is that he was walking. Now, he said he happened to be walking in, in the Himalayas. He could have had this uh, walking down the uh, street in New York City. But he looked down at his feet and he followed his feet up his legs, up his arms to his shoulders, and he realized it disappeared into nothingness. So he realized at that moment that he had no head, if you understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure if, so I, if I read a book like that, I wouldn't remember it. Yeah. Well, he, he <laughs> uh, was making the analogy to, to say that it was encompassed. The space where his head was uh, was the whole world, the whole experience of a uh, universal uh, being. So he basically came to that analogy by following his physical body up to his shoulders with his eyes and realizing that he couldn't see his head and that his shoulders basically disappeared into nothing, which was like sort of like a Zen uh, experience for him uh, at yeah. that moment. So it's an interesting book. You ever, I believe he's like 88 years old right now. He wrote mm. this in 1960. Yeah. But it's an interesting book you might like. Great. The living in the moment, the, I, I, at least as I think I hear you uh, uh, describe it, is. Uh, what I would I would call living living in the present. Yes, is what I would call it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that that's, that's basically it. Because when you you'll be in a field looking at a panorama of mountains or something like that, all of a sudden you can realize that if you uh, live in uh, perfect stillness at that moment, that it's like you uh, you disappear into the uh, into the panorama that you're seeing, and you tend to experience it in a like people walking on the beach, feeling the sand through their toes or. Thank you very much for, for calling. calling. No, no, Appreciate right. it. Thanks, Thanks for tuning in again. Bye. Yeah, you know, those experiences of uh, oneness with nature are absolutely uh, phenomenal and really are a form of natural mysticism that whenever I'm working with students and I'm talking about something like mysticism, uh, it's good to bring it all home.
And when you experience that, by, it might be a sunset or uh, of just sitting quietly by, by a brook, that's a clue as to other dimensions of reality. It's not the whole of it, but there, it's, a, it's a pointer, a suggestion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, a similar kind of comment I, I sometimes have shared with people, uh, th there seems to be a propensity in, in listening, thinking about our, our caller uh, to not live in the presence. So you say, I'll be happy when my, my kids uh, are out of diapers. I'll be happy when my kids are off in school. When I'll I win the megabucks. That's I'll be happy when I win the megabucks. Right. I'll be happy when, when uh, oh, I don't know, when I'm retired and I can finally do what I want to do. I'll be happy when and you, you're wishing your life away. Right. You know, you're not, in other words, what you have is now. And yeah. if you don't live in the, in the now, in the present, you don't have anything. You, know? you have to be happy wherever you are. The, and whoever you're talking with, like you, Michael, yeah. that, that, that's the most important thing in my life right now. Yeah. You know, it has to be. And if I don't live that way, if I don't say, well, I'll be getting home in a little while, and then I'm going to be doing something. If I do that, I don't live. That's I don't true. live. That's true. That's a good take-home message. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, yeah, our caller brought that to mind, <laughs> within me, anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I thank you very much for, for, for being uh, here with us today, uh, Michael. Is there, are there some, something, you, you, pulling things together you, you want to say? We, we have a few minutes left. I don't know if we put a, enough stuff out to pull together yet. <laughs> uh, I, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to summarize that. But going back to your first question about, uh, you know, why religions in the first place, which I related mm -hmm. to uh, mm -hmm. search for meaning, question comes up about the future of religion, uh, naturally, in this secular age, postmodern age, do we have any future for religion? And uh, my answer to that would be a simple one, uh, that as long as we still have that same problem of finding meaning on an individual basis, because nobody can ram their meaning down you and make it really yeah. stick, then you're going to have religious manifestations. And that's probably for as long as we're around as a species, I would, I would say. Mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine life without that, mm -hmm. that search. Uh, so I think, uh, by the way, that this program, this series, not simply because you asked me to be a guest, but I think it's a great idea. No, thank and you. I remember when we first talked about it, I was a little skeptical, but uh, I think that this type of program, this type of exchange is very valuable, particularly as it brings in the whole community mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. might really be the start of a larger dialogue. You know, that, I would hope. That can go on and we'll have to talk more about that off, off camera. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Mike. I'm, I'm glad you could come. Next next week, we're, we're having uh, a gentleman uh, talk about Islam, uh, and I'm asking people when they come to, to, to talk about uh, how they know God in and through their religion. We could have lectures about Islam forever, you know, or, or Buddhism or Hinduism or, 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 or Judaism, uh, uh, but I'm trying to avoid that. I, I don't want to make this a dry academic uh, presentation. I want to talk about from the heart, you know, what, what do you find that, that, that speaks to you in, in, your, in your heart, in your, in your religion? Can you share that with us? And so that's next week, and then there'll be these other religious groups following. So uh, please uh, tune in again, and uh, we look forward to participating with you and, and, and talking with you and sharing with you our, our, our ideas and our guests. And uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, if you have any further comments you, you want uh, to make, write in and uh, let us know.